Lord Jesus, thank you for being here with us right now. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Beginning in Genesis 12, we read the account of a man named Abram who left his homeland at 75 years of age and walked off into the promise of God with his 65-year-old wife, Sarai. God promised that his descendants would be like the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. But from day one, he and his wife were in an impossible situation. In her younger days, Sarai hadn't had any children, and now, at 65 years of age, she was well past her childbearing years. Ten years later, at 75 years old, things were even worse, so she did what was standard practice in her society at the time. She gave her slave, Hagar, to Abram as his concubine, and if she had a son, he would be considered Sarai's son. Hagar had no say in the matter. This was just the way it was done in those days. As it turned out, Hagar immediately got pregnant and things quickly went downhill in all the relationships involved. She developed a superiority complex against Sarai, which caused Sarai to mistreat her, and Hagar ran away into the wilderness. Sarai blamed Abram for the whole mess, and he just threw his hands up in the air and said, you do whatever you want to do. So for the moment, let's focus on Hagar. She was the pawn in this situation, the powerless one, being used by those who had control over her life. The truth is she hadn't seduced Abram to become his concubine. And she had no control over the fact that she became pregnant where Sarai couldn't. And now here she was, pregnant, persecuted, penniless, perplexed, with no place to go. It's not hard to imagine how lonely and vulnerable she felt out there in the wilderness. Loneliness can be a very debilitating emotion. To put it in context, one psychologist describes it as the distressing experience that occurs when one's social relationships are perceived to be less in quantity and especially in quality than desired. A sociologist by the name of Dr. Robert Weiss speaks of our very real need for attachment, social integration, nurture, reassurance of worth, and guidance in stressful situations. When we're lacking in any of these areas, we're quite likely to experience loneliness. I heard an older adult speak to a reporter a few weeks ago from the nursing home where she lives. For over a year, she hasn't been able to walk outside of the building or even go to the dining hall to eat with the other residents. They've all been locked in their rooms with no family visits, no interaction with friends, and no timetable for when things are going to change. She's incredibly lonely and feels like a convict in solitary confinement. And unfortunately, many people are also experiencing great loneliness right in their, their own home with family all around them. Nobody's talking to each other, and even when somebody tries, it just brings up old misunderstandings and hurts and disagreements that nobody really wants to deal with. So everyone just retreats to their own bedroom with their tablet and their TV, and there's no love and companionship even at home. It's just 
a lonely bunch of people stuck together in the same house. On the other hand, some are dealing with the pressing loneliness of wishing they had a significant other, a spouse to share life with, wondering why marriage hasn't come their way. They often ask the question, what's the matter with me? Why can't I have that kind of love relationship? How come so-and-so could get married and I can't? Then someone comes along who shows interest and as far as they can see, the suitor is definitely not marriage material. So they say again, what's wrong with me? How come it's only losers that like me? And please pardon the expression, but I'm, I'm using real words from real people expressing their innermost feelings. Then there's the loneliness of loss so many of us have experienced. The loss of a spouse, a parent, a child, or some other loved one who has died. The loss of a marriage that ended in divorce. The loss of a friend who suddenly doesn't want to talk to us and we have no idea why. The loss of a job that sustained us and now we're alone at home wondering where to turn. Right now you might be praying David's prayer recorded in Psalm 25. Turn to me and be gracious to me for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Job, the world's greatest representative of suffering, got to such a low place that he said, I despise my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone. My days have no meaning. So uh, what's the point of us talking through all this pain and heartache, loneliness and loss? Well, we must first get to the place of acknowledgement to face the unvarnished truth of where we are at this moment in our thinking, in our soul, and in our spirit. But there's another part of acknowledgement we also need to affirm. That is, there's nothing wrong with us. We're just normal human beings experiencing normal human emotions. That's part of the acknowledgement. We have to remember that we've been specifically created by God in his image and in his likeness. We are of infinite value to him. And he loves us with an everlasting love. His love is greater than any other love we could ever hope to experience. And in this knowledge, we can take some big steps forward to effectively deal with loneliness and minimize its negative impact on us. He will not leave us or forsake us. So now let's jump right into the very best strategy we can employ in this situation. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made a statement and taught us a principle we can apply. He said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In that scripture, Jesus was speaking against our human tendency to worry about money and material goods. And his solution was very simple. As we just read, our first step to breaking out of the cycle of money worries is to seek after God's kingdom and his righteousness. We do that first. That opens the door for God in his divine wisdom and power to take care of our material needs. In the same way, if we're seeking to relieve the loneliness and isolation we experience in this world, we first, first 
need to build a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As we grow our relationship with him, he helps us deal with the human relationships we desire to initiate or to enhance. Now, I, I was speaking about this message with someone a few days ago, and they asked me, is, is Jesus going to be the only solution you offer, or do you have something more? And I, I thought about it for a while, and realized that no, I have no better solution, nothing better to offer. Building our relationship with Jesus Christ is by far our best way forward. And until we get serious about that, every other potential solution to our loneliness problem will come up short. Jesus really is the answer. So let's continue on while we let that last point sink in. We don't always understand the reasons why God says and does certain things, but going back to Genesis 16, the angel of the Lord met Hagar as she was running from Sarai. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees, or El Roy. For she said, Have I also seen him who sees me? So, through this experience, Hagar learned that God sees and God hears. And that's very important to remember as we go forward. So Hagar stayed with Abram and Sarai another 17 years or so until Sarah, as her name had been changed to, miraculously gave birth to her own biological son, Isaac. At that point, after he was weaned, Sarah forced uh, Hagar and Ishmael to leave with nothing more than some bread and water. You'll read that in Genesis chapter 21. As wealthy as Abraham was, he had also been renamed by God. He sent his concubine and his own son away without a penny in their pockets. So once again, she found herself in the wilderness but now with the responsibility of raising a teenager as a single mother after this totally unfair, unreasonable, unnecessary, and, and uncalled for act by Abraham and Sarah. When they ran out of water in the desert, all she could do was weep as she looked at her son and waited for them both to die. As I mentioned earlier, the first time Hagar heard from the angel of the Lord, she left with the knowledge that God sees and God hears. And of course, that's good news for us. God sees us and he hears us. And we have to make it personal. God sees me and he hears me. So this time again, God saw Hagar and his angel called out to her from heaven, but now with a clear note of frustration in his voice. He said, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. In their weakness, no doubt, uh, they were just 
exhausted and, and Hagar, yes, he was probably a 17 year old boy, but she had to lift him up and support him. Uh, it, it was just a bad, bad spot. If you feel there's absolutely no one to turn to and no one who understands what's going on in your life, God sees and God hears. Listen to his voice speaking to your heart right now. As Shemora just sang for us, I won't leave you nor forsake you. I am here right now. I'm here. Like Hagar, he might be telling you something he's told you before, but maybe it'll sink in this time. Uh, for example, I'm sure you've heard the scripture that I quoted right at the start of our message. I will never leave you. Hebrews 13 verse 5. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am here. Talk to me. I understand you perfectly. I see everything you're going through. And I hear you when you call out to me. I am here. I know this isn't new to most of us, but we need to remember just how much God wants to talk to us. If we'll just open our eyes and our ears to him. If we open our eyes to his word, it's amazing how many times it will perfectly and precisely address our present and pressing needs. If we open our ears and listen to the word of God as it is taught and preached to us, we will receive insight and revelation to propel us forward into the amazing future God has for our lives. If we speak with the godly family members, friends, and counselors he has placed in our lives, he will reinforce these words into our hearts and our heads time after time. I am here. Well, there's something else I'd like us to consider today. Many people are living with broken hearts, broken lives, and even broken finances because they've invested great amounts of time, effort, and energy into relationships that have failed. This happens all the time. People fail us, and we end up feeling lonely, worthless, and sorry for ourselves. And all of this is for relationships that only last for this lifetime. One day the Sadducees posed a question to Jesus, trying to trip him up. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead at the end of time, so they asked Jesus a question that was intended to show just how silly uh, resurrectionists were. They said a man married a woman and had no children and died. In fulfilling the Leveret law of the Old Testament, the next brother in line married her to have a son in the name of his dead brother. Well, he also died childless, as did seven brothers in all who married her. So Jesus, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Uh, Jesus answered and said to them, are, are you not therefore mistaken? because you do not know the scripture nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Jesus laid it out plain and simple. We don't transport our human marriages to heaven. Now we know it's very important to God, our spouse and our children and our world to show them examples of unconditional love, kindness, compassion, and affection in our marital relationships. We also know that this takes a great deal of time, patience, commitment, and tenacity on our parts to accomplish this. But all of this is for a temporal relationship that only lasts as long as we're alive on this earth. Therefore, let's ask the following questions. Compared to the time we spend nurturing our earthly marriage, 
How much time, energy, and effort should we invest in nurturing our heavenly marriage relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ? The same question applies to you if you are unmarried. How much love, affection, desire, and commitment are we showing to our divine spouse versus the time we spend seeking an earthly spouse? And if we're not seeking a spouse, how much time do we devote to building relationships with extended family and friends versus the time we spend building our relationship with Jesus? I would humbly submit to you that it makes the most sense to devote our greatest time and effort into the one relationship that will last forever with the one who will never break our heart. And remember uh, the principle from Matthew 6, seek first a relationship with Jesus. All other relationships will come in their rightful place after that. The solution I'm putting forward sounds just like a well-rehearsed religious cliche until we actually put it into action. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time reading his word, which is his long love letter to us. Spend time speaking to him in prayer. And I, I'm not talking about some deliberate, scripted, programmed time on our knees before God. I'm talking about the kind of experience Charles Miles wrote about in describing his time with the Lord. He said, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. This is all about a daily, life-giving, joyful relationship that fills us with pleasure and fulfillment. It doesn't matter where we are in this world and what's happening in our lives at the moment. There is absolutely nothing that can ruin our relationship with Jesus. And the peace, the comfort, the love, the joy, the nurture, and the soul rest that he gives to us. I, I'm an early riser and I love going out for a walk in the morning. And that's when I get my best prayer time with the Lord. I, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I'll be going along just you know, putting in the uh, few kilometers that I do, and, and I sometimes have something in my ear, just listening to some uh, good music, or, or just talking to God. It is those are some of the most emotional times I've ever had with the Lord because yes, he is walking with me and he is talking with me and he is telling me I'm his own. It's a wonderful experience. And, and as Walter Hawkins and the Love Center Choir used to sing, never alone. I don't have to worry because I'm never alone. And so listen to what his word says to us throughout the Old Testament and into the New. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of good courage, Moses said to Joshua. Do not fear nor be afraid, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Have we heard this enough for t today? But I'll repeat it again, don't worry. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you've heard this one, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In Psalm 68, and verse 4, starting at verse 4, David said, Sing to the Lord, uh, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds, rejoice before him. His name is the Lord a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. The prophet Isaiah jumps in with another famous statement. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, 
for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Then we have the call from the lips of none other than Jesus himself. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Well, you'd certainly expect to hear something from the Apostle Paul on this topic. He says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I have to read this one in honor of our dear brother Owen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Then we read in Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. See, if we allow it, our minds will automatically go to a place of negativity where our focus turns to ourselves and the things that aren't as we would desire them to be in our lives. But we can make the decision today to apply this word to our minds and to think about things that will elevate us from lonely, solitary places into the direct presence of God. I'm not going to tell you that everything is going to turn around in a snap and all of a sudden you'll never ever have another uh, feeling of loneliness. But I am telling you that as Peter exhorts us, we can cast all our care upon him for he cares for us. And we can look to Jesus as we come back to our theme verse today. We have the assurance. I told you we'd come back to this. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Without a doubt, he is here. And he will take us through our valley of loneliness if we will let him into our hearts. And God, we worship you today. You who are our great God, our comforter, our sustainer, the one who comes alongside us, the one who is closer than a brother. We thank you, Lord, that in this world, in this time where so many are feeling lonely and isolated and, and apart from everyone else, Lord, I pray that you would come near to us and that we will be wise enough and that we will be uh, think in our own best interests to open the door and let you in. I pray, Lord, that you'll touch every heart. Help us, Lord God, to look to you first, to build our relationship with you first, to allow you to have first place in our lives. Because when we do that, all other things will come into their rightful perspective. And so we bless you today, Lord God. Thank you for your word to us. 
Thank you that you have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us. You are here right now, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Forsake you, I won't. 